You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. Maximize your effectiveness in the changing global business environment with a postgraduate Oxford Diploma in Global Business. Taught in four short modules over a year, the program is designed to accelerate your career and increase your impact while minimizing the disruption to your work and family life. Learn alongside senior executives from around the world and develop a lifelong network. Visit the Oxford Diploma in Global Business website to find out more. So, Carl Fry, thank you very much indeed for taking the time today to talk to me about uh, the technology trap and the research you've done uh, and you've just published in your new book uh, called The Technology Trap, published by Princeton University Press. And uh, I want to leverage your knowledge as an, as an economic historian uh, a, a bit. And uh, you characterize the different phases of uh, technological development. So uh, there are different typo typologies around. So what would you characterize as a different uh, phases of technological development starting from the Industrial Revolution? So what are distinct phases? What would you say? Right. So the book sort of divides economic history into four different phases. So the Great Stagnation, I call the period before the Industrial Revolution, where we also saw a lot of technological change, which I discussed throughout the book, but we didn't see that translate into higher incomes for the average population. Then we have what I call the Great Divergence, and that period economic historians usually sort of refer to the Industrial Revolution onward to just describe the divergence that happened between the West and the rest, if you like. And what I'm uh, referring to in the book is the great divergence that happened within Britain, which was the first country, country to industrialize. And the divergence is the divergence between industrial capital and, and the working population. Uh, as we saw, um, uh, mechanization drive up profits, but drive down uh, the wages um, of uh, uh, ordinary people. Um, the next phase I call this the Great Convergence is roughly sort of the end of the 19th century and up until the computer revolution in the 1980s, so the era of mass production, where we see that most people, uh, if not all, reap the benefits uh, from progress. We see a great leveling in wages. And then we have what I refer to as the Great Reversals, which is essentially the computer revolution onwards, where we see very similar trajectories uh, that we saw during the first uh, industrial revolution. Uh, the final chapter concerns the future, and it's uh, very much an open question. All right, but uh, you know, if you uh, if you would uh, be tasked to characterize each phase just a little bit, what sort of what are the key characteristics? So, what maybe stood out in you know as as a specific feature of each phase, and what were common features uh, across different sure. phases? So the theme of the book is that different technologies have different effects uh, on the labor market, right? So uh, to take two extremes, so the, the telescope, for example, didn't replace people in large numbers. It allowed us to perform previously unconceivable things, uh, and as a result, it created new tasks for labor. That is very different from, let's say, the uh, automatic elevator, which got rid of the human operator and reduce the demand for labor, put downward pressure um, on those uh, workers' wages. And if we look to history, we can see this, and this is not my own work, but we can see that um, uh, there's been very much a race between technology creating new tasks and repla technology replacing people in existing tasks. And Darren Asimoglu and Pascal Restrepo uh, have, uh, have formalized a model. Uh, um, of this, um, and I, what I do in the book is that I, I examine the lens, sort of uh, the histor uh, history of technological change through that lens, and I, and I find that it does a fairly good job um, at describing the trends we see. So the first industrial revolution was a play, uh, period of mainly labor replacing technological change. We saw that the mechanized factory replaced the artisan shop. We saw that middle income workers wages in terms of artisan craftsmen uh, men's wages vanished during this period of time, uh, very similar to the hollowing out of the uh, middle income 
uh, of the middle of the income distribution uh, that we've seen in, in our recent age of computerization. And, and in contrast, the 20th century was primarily a period of enabling technological uh, change. So technology creating new tasks for labor. All of these phases feature both enabling and replacing technological change, but the predominance of each uh, uh, sort of type of technology shifted over time. And what we saw very much in the 20th century was, yes, tractors and uh, other machines did replace people um, uh, on the farms. But this was very much a consequence of sheep labor leaving the countryside uh, for better paying jobs in mass production industries in cities, which in the first place gave economic incentives to mechanize uh, production and agriculture as labor shortage, uh, shortages emerged. So whereas the first industrial revolution was very much the push of labor in, out of middle income jobs, the 20th century was very much draw uh, people from the farms to new middle income jobs and what we've seen since the age of computerization which is essentially began in the 1980s has been again a push out of people from middle um, income occupations so the the first industrial revolution then was basically supply driven you know the, the technology was developed and then applications were found and these applications then tended to replace uh, people whereas if you understood you correctly in the 20th century it was demand driven because people moved away from the rural areas into the cities because of better economic opportunities there was a, a necessity a demand that then led to the creation of the technology to take care of this demand is, is this the are these the two primary drivers? Yes, I think there's a, that's sort of two key drivers. So we see enabling technological change, creating new, better paid jobs, creating demand for people to operate the machinery in the factories during uh, the 20th century. The uh, 19th century was very much of a push out of people uh, from um, uh, the artisan shop to uh, often uh, low paying jobs in agriculture, which I either fell back on, or also into factories. But the key feature of the first era of industrialization was that early spinning machines were uh, designed specifically to be tended by children as a mean of sort of sapping resistance to technological change because people didn't voluntarily often participate in the industrialization process. Uh, they frequently rioted against the mechanized, uh, mechanized factory. Uh, and the famous Luddite riots is actually one, just one example of a wave of riots that swept across Europe and even China. Yeah, we'll come to, to the social and economic uh, reactions to this in, in a second. But would you say that given that it has been traditionally a feature that has always been fear of automation or the fear that jobs might disappear for good, that these two trends were actually responsible for keeping a balance. Because on the one hand, there was a push up, but on the other hand, it always led to creating all types of new um, activities and, 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 and demand. So um, it, are these two drivers basically the reasons why we've, at least historically, we you never know what the future is gonna hold, but at least historically, we've had a sort of balance. Yeah, so I mean, I think we so we have different phases in history with regard to mechanization. I argue so before the industrial revolution, craft guilds very much resisted any technology that they believed threatened their skills and uh, their incomes, and and monarchs often fearing social unrest typically sided uh, with the guilds and frequently legislated to block the introduction um, of new technologies. And this is what I refer to in the book as the technology trap in which replacing technologies uh, were frequently resisted and even blocked, uh, which slowed down economic growth for a very long um, period of time. The difference during the Industrial Revolution wasn't the absence of resistance to technological change. So that's very much featured uh, uh, during the industrial, uh, industrialization process as well. Uh, the difference was that um, governments began to side with the pioneers um, of industry rather than angry workmen. Um, and I can speak a bit about the reasons for that if you like. Yes, please. Uh, but I think um, 
there are a number uh, of factors that are relevant here. So on the one hand, I think the turnpike trusts, which you know led to the construction of uh, better roads within Britain, um, reduced uh, transportation costs, and because the craft guild's political clout didn't extend uh, beyond their own city, their political clout was essentially eroded as competition grew uh, with um, other cities. Um, so the weakening of uh, the craft guilds also meant for governments that the threat from the below became less severe. Um, and in addition to that, um, growing or intensifying competition between na nation states made it harder for governments to align technological conservatism with the political uh, status quo. Uh, countries like Britain were very well aware that their military strength also depended on their uh, economic muscle and, and they would do nothing to jeopardize trade that provided the sort of the very foundation for that. Um, and the third reason is simply that merchant, uh, uh, merchant uh, manufacturers became um, an uh, increasingly wealthy and um, also politically influential group in the British economy uh, following the, the discovery of the new world and the rise um, of the British trading empire. So those are sort of the factors that shift in uh, um, uh, uh, the structure of political power that enabled the Industrial Revolution to first take place in Britain. So in the end, that Marxist analysis that it's dependent on class and power, uh, there's a lot to this, right? Well, so I think Marx and Engels, they were very much right about the period they lived in and uh, the, the period of time that they observed. Uh, as we all know, they weren't that correct about the future, which is a different matter. So, yeah, the analysis was right. The historic, historic determinism uh, was not. So, but the, the analysis was, was, was pretty, pretty sharp. And uh, you, already, you already mentioned um, that there were obviously uh, social and economic consequences as, as a result of this. And especially, you know, if we've just established a link between the application of, the, you know, technological opportunities uh, and, and how does this relate to power struggles. Um, so sort of what, what have been the social and economic consequences in these different phases of the application of new technologies? Sure. So, I mean, the Industrial Revolution saw a, a, a whole lot of uh, different unintended, uh, maybe some intended consequences as well, but a lot of... So, I mean, uh, so f f f the first thing to note is that before the Industrial Revolution, people worked, but few people had jobs in the modern sense, right? People, you know, structured their own work day. They often worked for themselves. They, you know, were in control of the means of production, uh, uh, if you like, uh, and they often worked under one roof with their own family. You know, that was a sort of pillar of the family structure was that people worked at home and they were very close to, the, to uh, their children. And it was only with the rise of mechanized industry in these factory cities uh, that created what Marx would eventually call um, a working class. And it took it essentially people from all across the country and put them uh, uh, into one uh, unhealthy uh, place. And by unhealthy, I don't just mean, you know, the, the appalling working conditions in the factories, but, you know, cities have to uh, adjust as well. They were very unhealthy environments uh, to live in uh, more in general. And people had to adjust to the rhythm of uh, the machine and the factory, right? All of a sudden, you know, the factories required a, a very different breed of worker capable at working at the pace of the clock. Uh, so this was an enormous transformation and that took place within uh, a few generations. And only so uh, quite understandably, um, people uh, were, uh, often res even uh, resisted uh, the mechanized factory. Now, later generations can surely be grateful that they weren't successful, uh, but that was probably little reassurance for the people who lived through the early period of industrialization. And indeed, they had no way of knowing that their grandchildren would be better off as a consequence. And what were the kind of, um, you know, social and economic consequences in later phases? I mean, in the 20th century, you know, mass production, uh, what, where the enabling driver was actually more, um, more prevalent than the than replacement driver. So what, what kind of different reactions did you get in these kind of phases? 
Yes, I think one reason that the you know, socialist revolution that Marx predicted didn't really happen that way is that essentially um, as people adjusted to uh, mechanization, as uh, new technologies like automobiles and electrical machinery and telephones and so on created new and better paid jobs in which the skills augmented machines, people became more their skills became more valuable. They were able to earn better wages. And, and even to the extent that what Marx once referred to as the working class were able to join the ranks uh, of the middle class uh, by the mid of the 20th century. Uh, so during this period of time, we saw for the first time uh, blue collar workers mixing with white collar workers. And this is essentially sort of the broad middle class that many of us have gotten used to, uh, and that sort of defined um, what, you know, a successful uh, democracy, a sex successful economy uh, was about. So the, the underlying reason that the historic determinism, uh, you know, and the, the class war did not come about was because the benefits of the technology eventually were democratized and were, were, were basically more widely spread across society, which helped to ameliorate their effect later on. Uh, whereas Marx pretty, pretty much predicted an increasing polarization that will lead to some sort of conflict at the end of it. That's right. So Marx didn't believe that wages could rise, so that mechanization could contribute to rising living standards of working classes. So is, is that kind of prism also a good one to look at the, the the more recent uh, application of technology. I mean, if you look at the at the current discussions, obviously the hollowing out, especially in the United States, uh, but in other countries as well, the hollowing out of the of the middle classes. Uh, you know, not spreading the the benefits of globalization and digitization fairly across society, uh, are often referred to as as reasons for. Uh, you know why they, you have social and economic and political reactions to what is happening at the moment. Would you would you um, agree with such an argument? Yeah, I agree with that. But so, so I think it's important to remember that when, for example, Malthus and Ricardo was writing, they sort of predicted that uh, technology couldn't improve the human lot because any uh, uh, economic growth would only translate into larger populations, uh, leaving us, you know, at the same level in per capita terms. And they were broadly right about uh, uh, sort of the historical pattern uh, they had observed until then. When Marx and Engels were writing about the immiseration of the, uh, uh, you know, um, working classes, um, they observed a period in which wages were falling behind uh, productivity growth and were even falling for some people, and they were right about that. When people at the mid of the 20th century were, you know, writing about the Kuznets curve and inequality, you know, automatically decreasing when, you know, a country reaches a mature state of industrialization and Bob Solo developing a model which with a balanced growth path uh, in which um, Technological progress essentially, you know, benefits every social group. They were essentially right about that period of time. And, and more recently, you know, people feel very uncomfortable with the uh, levels of inequality and the polarization uh, uh, we have seen. I think the uh, sort of historical mistake has also been to extrapolate from, you know, the recent past and say that this is inevitably going to continue in the future as well. And I try to avoid that uh, uh, in the book, and I hope, hope I do so uh, successfully, because I think it has very much to do uh, with the type of technologies that are being developed. Uh, my conclusion, however, is that very many of the technologies that we see on the horizon are of the replacing type, especially for uh, um, low skill, uh, low income type of jobs. And I think that many of the trends that we're seeing right now um, are likely to continue at least for some time, uh, not necessarily in, indefinitely. There's nothing uh, uh, you know, that uh, would allow us to, 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 to uh, uh, draw any uh, uh, specific conclusions about that. Um, but uh, I think there are reasons to be concerned about sort of a, a continuation of current trajectories, because as you point out, we've seen the hollowing out of middle income jobs. We've seen increasing economic and, and also political polarization. And I think that is sort of very much reflects changes in technology. A lot of the focus has been on globalization. I think most economists agree that technology has been the predominant uh, factor in that. Um, and 
uh, like in the 19th century when people expressed uh, 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 many of their concerns about um, rapid mechanization, I think that people could potentially also opt for policies to restrict uh, the uh, implementation of some of these technologies uh, if they feel that the skills and incomes are uh, threatened uh, by them. Um, yeah, and I think you make a very uh, interesting and important point. Uh, what you're describing is basically a, uh, a history, economic history of different waves, you know, replacement enabling, replacement enabling, which goes against the grain of uh, what you described, that you try to uh, extrapolate linear developments out of past uh, data. So uh, you're bound to sort of be grounded in one phase and that might not be a very good predictor to, you know, where we're going uh, to the future. So in, in that sense, each phase has to be uh, judged on its own merits as well, rather than just being uh, seen as just a continuation of historical trends and data. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, and and uh, there the, the, there seems to be also at least a few different um, elements of the current phase we're living through that um, seem to be unique. Um, I mean, in the discussion about globalization, we, we had this argument that before the First World War there was already a, uh, a, a a similar type of globalization that was observable. Uh, but I think by now in the twenty first century, it's probably gone way beyond was what was feasible before the First World War. So you have uh, this kind of uh, globalization that is, 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 is basically interacting with technology uh, developments that have produced an interconnectedness uh, processing power uh, um, that has never been, never been there. And uh, if you look at current trends, I mean, quantum computing, some people believe that, you know, uh, applications of quantum computing might be around the corner in five to 10 years. And if you, you know, throw that kind of processing power onto uh, self-learning algorithm and other forms of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I mean, that seems, that seems unprecedented. So how would uh, your judgment of the current phase be uh, on the basis of that kind of um, wave model of different ways of technologies throughout economic history that you've identified? Sure. So I think in my mind, uh, Richard Baldwin has quite pervasively shown that this era of globalization is very different from the era of globalization that we saw leading up to um, World War I. Uh, in the sense that the first era of globalization was very much about the reduction of transportation costs and the movement of goods um, across space. Uh, globalization since the uh, dawn of computerization um, has more been about the um, uh, ability to coordinate production also at distance. So companies have been able, due to computers, but also technologies obviously like the container ship, uh, been able to uh, take advantage of cheap labor in countries like China uh, and restructure their supply chain uh, to, to, to take advantage um, of that. Now, my view is very much that the rise of China has already happened, and most people today uh, already work in non-traded uh, uh, sectors or non-traded occupations um, of the economy. So, actually, most people today are relatively shielded, I believe, to the um, effects of future globalization, uh, but they aren't uh, shielded uh, from the impacts of um, automation. So take the job of a truck driver or of a receptionist, of a waiter. These are all jobs that are very, uh, has remained or been hard to automate uh, very much up until now, but are sort of gradually um, within uh, uh, the possibilities of computerization, but they are not offshoreable. And so my prediction would be as we see sort of this trade war now playing out and people realize that hiking up tariffs is not going uh, to bring, you know, mining jobs back. People would potentially do well to go and see how automated many of these steel mills uh, in Europe, for example, um, actually are today. Um, and when they find out that globalization is not the culprit, they are likely to look for something else. Um, and that is, I think, likely to be automation. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly, I mean, if you 
if you, if you take your sort of counterbalancing uh, developments into into what we're seeing at the moment, I mean, a uh, short time ago, I spoke also to David Alter from, uh, from MIT about this. And he obviously came up with this dumbbell model where you have on the one hand, uh, highly skilled jobs, especially in, in urban centers uh, that seem to be, you know, driven by this new technology. At the same time, you have the replacement. Uh, element of this uh, and more and more concentrated apparently in rural areas. So are we entering maybe a phase where both of these dynamics that you uh, you know outlined that were applying in different phases, maybe maybe we have these coming together and uh, you know being applied at the very same time, driving a a, a tendency of of polarization that we haven't seen before. Because also, what one thing seems to be a different a different is that technology development is becoming quicker and quicker. So maybe uh, in, 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 in throughout history, it's taken longer for uh, technology to be pervasive, uh, to go into society. At the, today, um, I mean, you have the uh, the tendency that if you develop a good app, it can be a global phenomenon, uh, not, not quite overnight, but in a, in a very short period of time, uh, which is also why markets seem uh, different. I mean, I find this view interesting that companies are no longer competing in markets, but for markets. Uh, because the winner uh, is so quick to absorb all the competition if there is a superior product or service uh, that the dynamics have completely changed. So uh, could, could one of the features of today be that these, these two developments that we had historically uh, taken turns might apply at the very same time? Right. So, so first of all, I think, so I think there's a case to be made that innovation uh, is picking up or accelerating. I think, you know, you can argue along those lines. I'm not so sure if the spread of new technologies is happening that much faster. And sure, you can say that, you know, the smartphone spread uh, much quicker than the steam engine. Uh, but I don't think we should compare the spread of consumer goods with the spread of technologies that are being applied in production. Uh, the latter requires a lot of reconfiguration of production processes, organizational structures, complementary investment in skills, and businesses that decide on whether to automate or not, they have to sort of weigh in a lot of factors and there, whether it's sufficiently large markets to automate, whether, you know, the cost of scrapping old equipment, the cost of financing new equipment, uh, you know, whether you can find talent to operate the machines. One of the sort of great hurdles to tractor adoption was that many people thought that the tractor is too, too good a machine to be put in the hands of a poor operator. Uh, and, you know, it was only when when uh, uh, courses were being developed to bridge the skills gap, if you like, that sort of uh, adoption uh, really picked up. And, and I think these sort of factors uh, still uh, all come into play. So there's always going to be complementary investments required for the intro introduction of new technology and you will always deal with things like the human factor, worker resistance, adverse public opinion, legislation, uh, all of these are still hurdles. Uh, so none of this I think is going to happen overnight. And I do however very much worry um, as, as, as you mentioned about the direction that technological change is taking. So what we see is that many sort of these very skilled uh, technology industries, they tend to be highly clustered uh, because they benefit from being in places which have skilled populations, they benefit from knowledge spillovers um, across companies. Um, and when a new sort of tech job is being created uh, in a city like uh, Oxford, what happens is that person goes out in the local service economy and spends his or her money on in-person uh, type of services that have remained hard to automate, which is sort of further contributing to the clustering um, of uh, economic activity. And, and on the other hand, we're seeing that, you know, with the automation of, uh, of factories uh, recently, one factory jobs also supported in the past a lot of jobs in the local service economy. So the uh, implications of a few some jobs being automated 
weight uh, automated way in, in, in Detroit is not just a decline of manufacturing industry, but a decline of the local economy and, 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 and the community more uh, broadly. And I do worry very much that we're going to uh, uh, continue to see uh, this pattern with skill cities pulling away uh, from the rest and I think that is also what is driving uh, much of the political polarization that we're seeing today. Yeah, it's interesting I mean, because in theory, you know, this, these kind of technologies would allow you to work from, from everywhere, anywhere, right? That was one of the early promise, uh, but uh, yeah. apparently telework has not replaced networking. I mean, in theory, we can do what we are doing now, right? From Berlin to Oxford and having have a conversation um, via internet telephon uh, telephony. But uh, if you do research, you hugely benefit from having your colleagues around physically every single day in a setting of a university. So uh, this is one of these are one of the things you, you cannot simply just replace with, with technology. So the network effects of um, of cities uh, seem to be stronger. Uh, and enabled, maybe if you, you stay with your sort of typology, uh, the, the network effect is enabled by technology because it boosts actually the application of some of these technologies uh, if you do it in, in, in the framework of a network which tends to be geographically located. And on the other hand, uh, you know, rural areas seem to be, they are, they are uh, sort of vulnerable to structural change. I mean, in Germany, there's a big discussion about uh, some coal mining areas that are being sort of wound down now in a process uh, of 10 to 15 years. So, you know, there is a, there's a negative story and, um, and these population trends seem, seem, to, seem to continue. So there, there is a source of political polarization for you and you think that will continue? Yeah, so um, I think it's important to remember that every revolution in information and communication, uh, communications technology since the development of the printing press has led to, you know, uh, the world becoming uh, less uh, even uh, at least in economic terms. So with the arrival of the printing press, you saw that particularly uh, trading hubs benefited and pulled away from the rest. And you know, with every technology since the telephone, at least, you have had discussions about whether the city would become obsolete and it has never happened. And if anything, urbanization has uh, accelerated and uh, especially in relatively uh, in cities with relatively skilled uh, populations. So um, I do think that this is a tendency that is likely to continue, especially since new technology seems to be more skill intensive uh, rather than less. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, so let's let's get to the to the predictive uh, sort of future part. And uh, we've already alluded to to one one potential trend, which is urbanization continues, which is likely to lead to uh, more polarization between uh, center the center and periphery and the uh, city and and rural areas. So, what is your uh, your prediction other than saying you know you already alluded to that you think that the replacement capabilities of technology will continue in the short term. So what, what exactly do you have in mind? So what, uh, in your view, is, is likely to drive this kind of replacement um, going forward? Right. So my prediction is that it's going to be very hard to make predictions. And if you make one, you're very likely to be wrong. <laughs> and the reason I say that is that I think that very much is going to play out in politics rather than in technologies. I think that the political economy of technological change is going to be what determines outcomes. Um, and I think when uh, large parts of the population are left behind by technological change, uh, that sort of uh, uh, opens up possibilities for somebody with more radical ideas to come around and, you know, uh, speak with enthusiasm about the new path, uh, and that path can, you know, uh, take you down uh, to a very different place. And and we basically str struggle to predict the outcome of you know the next general election uh, the very same day. So I'm not going to sort of predict exactly how this is um, going uh, to play out. Um, but the key message is that. Our shared long-term prosperity very much depends on how we tackle uh, this uh, in the short run. 
Uh, I'm an economist, so I believe in the division of labor, and I wouldn't claim that I have all uh, the solutions. I, you know, point to a few in the book, but I do think that we need some sort of more, uh, more thinking about how we manage uh, the short-term, uh, short-term disruptive effects of technological change, because I think that will determine what the future looks like. And I think the technology in itself has a tendency to potentially replace low-skill, low-income workers in transportation, construction, uh, warehousing, retail. Those are some of the sectors that we are see sort of are most exposed to new technologies. I think that artificial intelligence could likely to make doctors more productive, not replace them. I think it will make more our jobs uh, more uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, but I do think that we're likely to see a continuation um, of the current trajectory with technology replacing uh, low skill, low income jobs and augmenting uh, relatively uh, skilled jobs. Uh, but as I said, that is sort of the trajectory of the technology for the time being that might change in the future. But more importantly, uh, the adoption of these technologies are going to depend on whether people, first of all, want to adopt them and, you know, whether we actually manage to make this a, a, a sort of uh, something which most people benefit from. Yeah, well, as, as, as Niels Bohr once said, predictions are difficult, especially if they concern the future, right? So um, there I you go. <laughs> but if you, if, you, if you mentioned that, you know, political economy or political decisions are crucial in terms of how all of this will uh, play out, um, if you put yourself uh, yourself into the shoes of a policymaker, and and you were tasked with uh, managing uh, these kind of developments and transitions, what would your top three priorities be? So uh, you know where would you start, and and what kind of comprehensive policy package uh, would you go for? So I think the key challenge today lies in the fact that people are living in very different realities. So the communities where which have suffered from industrialization uh, are very different places uh, from the hubs of innovation uh, which have prospered uh, since the computer revolution of the 1980s. And I think because of this segregation, people you know struggle to see uh, the realities uh, on the other uh, side. Um, and I think there are. Um, a number of challenges uh, that, or, or, or a number of policies that can help to bridge uh, that gap and allow people in declining uh, regions and cities also participate in the growth um, of other places. And so where I grew up, for example, in uh, southern Sweden, it's a, a little city called Lund. It's called to another, close to, to another place called Malmö. Uh, Malmö uh, was a city that prospered because of its shipyard uh, for uh, um, uh, uh, numerous decades. And, and when the shipyard bank, uh, went bankrupt back in the 1980s, the city essentially was in decline uh, up until the point uh, that the Resund Bridge wa was built to Copenhagen. And that essentially allowed people in Malmö to stay put where they were, stay still close in their, to, to, to their family and uh, their community, to work in Copenhagen, tap into an expanding labor market, commute to work there, commute back in the evening, spend their money locally, which again gave a boost to the local service economy. So by connecting places through clever infrastructure and investment, I think that uh, a lot can be achieved. Um, I also think that schooling uh, or opportunity varies a lot across space because of, you know, in part, parents and their involvement in, in, in uh, the children's education, but also that is in turn exacerbated by the lack of uh, educational opportunities in some places. And I think that things like childhood education can to some extent uh, help 
bridge that opportunity gap. Uh, we know that investment in early childhood education has a positive effect on children's probability to then go to college and uh, sort of uh, uh, participate in the democratic process, go to elections, uh, civic engagements, uh, all sorts of things. So I think um, that is an important aspect of it as well. Um, and it seems that some families struggle to move uh, for purely financial reasons as well. And moving to a new job is essentially an investment that requires liquidity up front uh, to, 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 to move into a, a better place. Um, so potentially subsidizing people's relocation to places where new jobs are an emerging, uh, uh, I think is, is one um, aspect of this which governments could uh, look into. Hey, this is very interesting. That's exactly the discussion uh, that is currently taking place here. I, I mean, I now live in, in, in Brandenburg in the Berlin conurbation area. And within that one state, it's literally uh, that because it wraps around Berlin, the yeah. Berlin adjacent areas are thriving because it's driven by, you know, what is what is happening in the capital. But at the same time, the, the, the coal mining areas that are now restructuring that I mentioned before, th these are in the south of the of the, of the of the country, and one of the ideas is um, to build what they call um, uh, corridors, which would basically be infrastructure to make sure that you know train lines are fast trains and 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 and, and, and similar types of uh, connectivity is actually happening uh, and and connects. Uh, these uh, rural areas uh, to where actually the music plays, you know, where the activity is is happening. Uh, and th the other thing that I'm not sure would be interested in, in your opinion on it, if you, there's another discussion about industrial policy. I mean, is it is it beneficial or potentially beneficial to put sort of centers of excellence and new centers, particularly by design, into areas uh, that so far have been underserved, or is this basically just cutting you know, these centers off from the network effects that you actually need in order to become successful. Uh, can this work um, or, or how can this or is the clustering more important than, than using that kind of directive industrial policy to try to specifically re-engineer um, the economy in, in specific areas? So I generally prefer uh, investments in human capital uh, rather than physical capital for the simple reason that physical capital states put and human capital you can still uh, take with you. Uh, not just for that reason, but uh, I think it's a, it, it's a good reason. Um, so it's, it's a very much a debated subject, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, the best study I'm aware of comes from Enrico Moretti, co-authors, and they look at the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, um, which was sort of part of the New Deal in the United States back in the 1930s. And that was a sort of huge uh, project which leveraged new technology like electricity, dams, and so on. Uh, and the regions that received these enormous investments uh, uh, grow more rapidly as a consequence. And you can see sort of positive effects as late as the 2000s, although the, the effects sort of start to tail off. Um, but the finding is also that these places grow at the expense of other places as sort of, uh, you know, economic activity is shifted. Um, and there's a lot of money being spent on many of these uh, on, on place-based policies. Um, and in the United States, uh, almost as much is being spent on place-based policies as unemployment insurance. Uh, so I think we need to trade these things very carefully against each other. Um, and I think that with sort of the era of manufacturing, industrial policy probably made more sense than it does now. So I, I generally see a diminishing role for industrial policy uh, rather than a growing one. Uh, but I'm sure there would be a lot of pushback from certain places on that. Yeah, maybe you should th probably think about uh, industrial policy more broadly as economic policy. And if you think about it in terms of econo economic development, maybe in conjunction with infrastructure investment to make sure that, you know, uh, there's an interesting strategy which is clustering the clusters. 
So not just having the clusters develop, but you know, having a sort of meta structure, uh, trying to leverage uh, the effects of, uh, of, of uh, clusters as well. I mean, that, that seems to be the case in Europe. You have certain clusters of excellence in certain areas. If you look sort of Southwest Germany, so car manufacturing and, and, and things like that. Um, but there's very little sort of uh, in terms of European oversight or trying to connect these clusters and try to leverage the strength uh, of these clusters to build something even on top of that. So maybe, yeah. maybe that is um, a, a direction to think of. Uh, Ka, um, we already uh, have been speaking for 40 minutes and uh, thank you very much indeed again for taking the time to discuss with me uh, the you know, technological developments and what kind of uh, impacts uh, we'll have. I think the, your predictions have been uh, broad enough uh, that nobody can say you've been right or wrong, uh, but it's, it's more important to identify the drivers and, uh, and as everything is really up to be shaped, um, I think that's important, uh, the important thing to get the analysis right. Again, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. <laughs>